building a stammer is a massive effort. And you saw how difficult. Basically, you have to craft a very precise uh, set of rules to strip off the suffixes in just the right conditions and not strip them off in the conditions where they would hurt things. Um, so uh, building a stemmer, it requires a lot of time and it requires somebody who is really, really good um, at, at, at knowing the structure, the morphology um, of the language. Uh, and for, um, for, for large languages, languages that have lots of speakers and lots of resources, languages like English, German, French, uh, there are excellent stemmers um, out there. Uh, but sooner or later, if you're building a search engine, you will bump against a language that uh, does not have a lot of resources devoted to it. And you don't have a linguist in Cebuano, for example, and you cannot afford to wait five years until that linguist, even if you found him, develops a good set of rules for con converting Cebuano words to Cebuano stems. Um, so, so what could you do? Well, um, it turns out that there is a really cheap alternative uh, that works maddeningly well, yes, for European languages, at least. And uh, what you do is we're going to play the same trick that we played with Chinese. Right? We're going to take our words, and instead of trying to analyze them morphologically, we're going to split them up into character <coughs> anagrams. So, this is what it looks like. I'm going to take the word document, and let's say I work with, uh, with a foreground. So what I do is I take the first four letters, D-O-Q-C-U, docu, and that becomes a token. And then I take the next four letters, O-C-U-M, docu, and then that becomes the second token. So I take a word, and I basically slice it up into a bunch of overlapping substrings of the same length. Really, really simple, right? I can do that without knowing anything about the language, without even speaking the language. Okay. Um, so now, in this particular case, I'm not crossing word boundaries, uh, but you have variants of this technique where you either do or do not cross the boundaries. So you can do it, uh, you can do it either way. Uh, but here I'm stopping at the end of document, right? And then will has only four letters. So uh, it's, it's only one foreground that's generated from that word. And then the word describe. Uh, gets split up into these uh, little uh, foregrams. And then it's these little foregrams that serve as the indexing units, that serve as uh, keys into your dictionary when you're doing the matching between the documents and the queries. And of course, it's critical that you do exactly the same thing for the queries, otherwise nothing will match. So now, why is this a good thing to do? You're taking perfectly legible English text and turning it into a completely in illegible uh, gibberish. Um, and the trick is to keep in mind, it's gibberish only for you, only for your human eyes. And the algorithm is actually really, really happy with working with that sort of a description. Why is that? Well, so say I have, say I have the word describe uh, in a document, <coughs> and queries might have the word describe, or they could also have uh, variants of the word describe. Right? So uh, if my document had describe and the query had describe, then the document would, would match the query one, two, three, four, five times on each one of those uh, foregrounds. If my document had the word description, which a good stammer would conflate to the word describe, but I don't have a stammer. But if I do the foreground, these are the foregrounds for description, and I'm actually getting three uh, matches. Three of those foregrounds are the same as for the word describe. For the word prescribing, which is another, uh, which is another word that you might want to conflate to describe, uh, you again get three, uh, three, <coughs> three matches. Um, for words like descent or cribbage, uh, you get one match, but it's only one. So you will get accidental matches. You are introducing noise, uh, but it's a good kind of noise. It's the kind of noise where the right matches will still dominate the accidental matches. So it's, um, and you, you'll see this idea over and over uh, in this course. So uh, that's what you can do. You can do it for English. You can do it really effectively for just about any European languages. Uh, and for most European languages, you need N at around 4 uh, or 5. So you, didn't, you don't even have to mess with lower n-grams or higher n-grams. <clears throat> now, how well does it work? 
it actually works surprisingly well. So what I'm getting, what I'm giving you here is, uh, so this, this was a study done a few years back on a bunch of European languages comparing the effectiveness, how accurate your search engine is going to be if you use words versus if you use a good stemmer versus if you use character anagrams. Right? So, um, um, so, so, so this column, the words, this is what happens if you don't do any kind of morphological analysis. If you just tokenize on spaces and punctuation and match the queries that way. Uh, and uh, so here's what happens if you use Morphesser, which is one, uh, one family of stemmers. Here's what happens if you use Snowballs. Snowballs uh, Snowball is, in general, more accurate, but it, uh, the stemmers aren't available for quite as many languages. Uh, Morphesser is available for just about every European language out there. And this is what happens if you use uh, foregrounds. Right? So uh, we can take, a, I don't know, a language like German. Right? So, uh, if you use words in German, you get average precision of about 34. Um, so uh, the higher numbers are better, right? Uh, if you, uh, th so that's without morphology. If you do morphology through Merfesser, you get about a 41. And if you do four grams, you get a 42. Right? Uh, so that's, uh, that's, that, that's impressive. It's a really dumb technique, and it actually <coughs> does uh, quite well. Um, now, you could, you could say, well, German, you know, German morphology is simple. They just concatenate things. Right, let's take let's take a uh, let's take a language that prides itself on uh, on being creative with morphology. So take something like Russian. Right, surely it couldn't work on Russian, um, uh, but surprisingly it does. Right, so Russian with just the words is twenty six, which is pretty bad, uh, and that's not surprising. It's a language that has lots and lots of variation. So if you don't handle the variation, you get poor performance. Uh, if, you get, if you build a pretty good stemmer for Russian, you get a 33, but with anagrams, you actually get a 34. Uh, and um, and you, you'll see examples here where the differences are even more dramatic. So I think the um, finish is particularly impressive, right? You, get, you go from 32 to 38 to 48 with four grams, which uh, I'm sure many Finns would find that puzzling. Question? Uh, um, what are So the question is, what is the units of those numbers? Uh, we haven't talked about those numbers yet. For now, just they reflect the accuracy of your search engine. We'll cover that in like five lectures. Uh, so, but the, num uh, the, the higher the number, the better the results of your search engine would be. Uh, basically, a search engine where all the relevant documents go at the top and then all of the non-relevant documents go after that would have this number at, uh, at 1. Um, if you're curious, the number itself is mean average precision. Um, and you can, lop, you can look it up, but we'll cover it in a, in a, in a, in a few lectures. OK, so um, really simple, on the surface, really brain dead technique works really, really well, a lot better than stemmers for, uh, for a lot of the languages. Uh, now, um, so it's not actually true uh, for English in this case. It's because English has had stemmers developed for decades. Right? So the stemmers for English, I mean, they're, they've pretty much nailed it. That's because they've had <laughs> decades to work on it.